Welcome to the 351st episode of the Reading and Writing Podcast. Stay tuned for my interview with Donna Hemmons, author of the novel Tea by the Sea. Stay tuned for the interview. The Reading and Writing Podcast is brought to you by Libro FM. Libro.fm lets you purchase audiobooks directly from your favorite local bookstore. You can pick from more than 185,000 audiobooks, including bestsellers and recommendations from booksellers. You'll get the same audiobooks at the same price as the largest audiobook company out there, but you'll be part of a different story one that supports your local community and your local bookstore. If you're new to audiobooks, they're the perfect way to get more books into your busy life. You can listen during your commute, while doing chores, walking the dog, or just relaxing at home. All you need is a smartphone and the free Libro.fm app. If you already love audiobooks and don't know what to listen to next, check out recommendations and curated lists from people who know audiobooks best, your local bookseller. Here's your special offer from the Reading and Writing Podcast. Get two audiobooks for the price of one today with your first month of membership with the code RWPODCAST at checkout. This offer is only valid for new members in Canada and the U.S., Check out Libro.fm today. Welcome back to the Reading and Writing Podcast. My guest today is Donna Hemmons. Her new novel is Tea by the Sea. Miss Magazine just featured Tea by the Sea in their June Reads for the Rest of Us. Donna, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me, Jeff. Sure. Well, if someone listening hasn't heard about Tea by the Sea yet, how would you describe your new novel? Well, it's a story about a young mother who spent 17 years searching for her baby or her child who um, who was taken from her at birth. And do you remember the original idea that led you to write Tea by the Sea? Uh, Yeah, it's um, basically, I think it's a um, three-part, it has a three part start. Um, so initially, I wanted to write a story about a group of strangers who went to a church and refused to leave. And, um, you know, I had that idea, I wrote it down, and I didn't really have a sense of where the story would be going or why they would be there. And um, so sometime after that, I started writing a short section about a mother who uh, was getting her children ready for school. And she went through a litany of things. The, she then dropped the children off and was on her way to work. But instead of actually going on the train and move, going on to work, she turned around and left and went to that church. So then I knew who was in the church, but again, I didn't know why. Um, and so I, I left it alone for a little bit. So sometime after that, I was in Jamaica. And there is a radio program that comes on on Sunday evenings called Sunday Contact. And um, basically, anybody can call in to look for people they have lost touch with. And so on that particular um, trip, a woman called in and she was looking for her child. And the child had been taken by the father. And at that point, the child was about eight years old, but she didn't know where the child was, where the father had gone with him and how to get in contact with them. And so once I heard that, I said, this is my story. This is the woman in the church and this is what she's looking for. She wants to find her child. Right. And and so was the writing process for Tea by the Sea similar to your first novel, River Woman? Um, in some ways, yes. I had the idea and I started writing it and it. Uh, I think the story flowed in a way somewhat easily but um with river woman i wrote that as my thesis my aunt my graduate thesis for my mfa so i had in some ways i guess a somewhat different process because i you know had workshops and i had a group of people who i would be, you know i'd be turning in um, portions of that novel for the workshop so i i think that process was a little bit different with um tea by the sea it is actually the fourth book that I have written, but the second one published. And um, so the process for the for- first book and the fourth book were somewhat similar. And the second and third book, I have just um, had a much longer time 
with writing those and revising. So with that second and third book, if you don't mind my asking, um, did you try to get those published or was it something that you wrote them and decided to work on something else? Um, a bit of both. I, um, I did try and I also knew that they weren't quite where I wanted them to be. At least one, I had an agent early on who I was working with and, um, we, um, the book at that point hadn't been finished, so it wasn't, it, it wasn't fully, com- it wasn't ready, it wasn't fully ready. Um, but I also knew that there, there were issues with the stories that I wanted to address and I didn't quite know exactly how to address them. And I think with some distance, I, I now know what I want to do with both of those stories. And have you thought about going back to those? Oh, yes, I am. (laughs) So one, I think I have finished revising. At least I like the version that I have now. And I think I have told the story that I wanted to tell. And it it just took me, um, you know, a a completely different route to get to the story that I wanted to tell. Right. And I know you also work on short fiction. Um, when you start working on um, a short story as opposed to a novel, do you know it's a short story? Usually I do. And I'm not quite sure exactly what it is that tells me that it's a short story or that it's a novel. But it's something in either looking at the character, looking at the idea for it that feels weighty or feels like it will need you know, like 200, 300 pages to get that story told. Whereas with with the short stories, um, you know, pretty much once I start writing it, I know that it's a short story. Right. Uh, you know, it's one of those things where I sometimes, you know, hear um, people say they've taken a short story and turned it into a novel. And I, I don't, you know, that's a very different process for me. I don't understand how they <laughs> I see them differently from the outset. Right. Well, your novel T by the Sea covers 17 years. Did you plot that 17 year timeline before you started writing the book or how did that come together? Well, when I started writing it, I had every intention to write a story that was set over a 24 hour period. So I just wanted the mother to head to that church and um, the story to unfold that way with, um, you know, a lot of backstory telling us what happened and how she got there. And um, that didn't quite work. So I had to shift it and went from, uh, you know, 24 hours to 17 years. Um, <laughs> so I think in some ways it, you know, and it certainly worked a lot better. But I had the material. I knew what, what, what had happened over that time period. I just had to shift the way in which I told the story to make it work better. And what are your earliest memories of reading and books? Um, I have a very early memory of my father reading Shakespeare to us. And the only thing I remember is um, Lend Me Your Ear. I have no idea what, and I, yeah, I, that's my earliest memory. Um, outside of that, um, you know, for my own self, I spent, you know, weekends or summer holidays, we, you know, my sisters and I would go to the library and um, read pretty much, I think, every book that the libraries had. Um, if they had a, you know, like summer reading competition, we were the ones who were reading, we were the ones who got the whatever gift they had for reading the most books. But um, those are my earliest. Memory. Sure. Well, you mentioned earlier the MFA program where you wrote your first novel, River Woman. What was the path to publication for you to writing and publishing that novel? And had you always wanted to be a writer before you started in an MFA? I think, um, well, as an undergrad, I took uh, some creative writing um, classes. And at that point, you know, once I, when I um, started undergrad, I wanted to be a lawyer and I decided studying English would be a great foundation um, for, you know, my law career later on. And I started working on a school newspaper and um, realized that, you know, law wasn't necessarily what I wanted to do. I wanted to write. And um, so between writing, you know, doing journalism and uh, writing short fiction, 
um, for my undergraduate classes, I knew that there was something there that I wanted to do, uh, that the type of writing that I wanted to do or my um, links to literature was not necessarily as a um, preparation for law school, but that was what I wanted to do. I wanted to tell stories. And um, what solidified it for me was an independent study class that I took, where I one of the books that the professor had me read was Zora Neale Hurston's Their Eyes Were Watching God. And um, it's, you know, reading that book, looking at the language that was in there, looking at the community, I felt like I was at home and I felt that I wanted to do something similar. I wanted to write those kinds of stories about the Jamaican communities that I grew up with and around. And um, so once I finished undergrad, I worked for a few years as a business journalist and did not necessarily love it. I knew that there was something else that I wanted to do. And I applied for a couple of creative writing programs and then ended up at American University. It, so at that point, once I, when I started actually looking at creative writing programs, I had started writing a book, which at that point I was calling River Women. And I, I didn't quite know exactly what I wanted to do with it. I knew that it wasn't a short story. I knew that I wanted to write a novel, but I didn't necessarily know how to go about writing a novel. So I figured a creative writing program would be the place where I would be able to spend the time and actually work on it. So about a year or so, so I finished it as my thesis and about a year or so after I was done, I, after, you know, after doing some more revisions, I found an agent and we actually sold that book um, relatively quickly after that. Well, as you worked on getting your first stories and novels written and your first novel written and published, were, were there any specific writing challenges that you had to overcome or figure out, whether it be characterization, plotting, dialogue? Um, characterization largely when I, um, with River Woman, um, that story is about a woman whose child drowns and, um, she was about to migrate from Jamaica. So there is some concern as to whether she didn't want to leave her child behind and migrate on her own or if the child accidentally drowned. And, um, so one of the things that I had to figure out very early on was whether or not that story could be told completely or entirely in the first person. And I realized that because of what I wanted to do, I wanted to raise the question of, of, you know, in some ways, what is truth? And is there, can there be several versions of the truth depending on your perspective? Um, so I realized that if I used only a single perspective in that story, I wouldn't get at what I wanted to do. Uh, so what I ended up doing with that book was writing, um, was alternating um, perspectives. So I had have both the first person from the young woman, Khalid. I have the a voice that is the town's perspective and I have her mother's perspective. Um, so that it was, it, it was a challenge in some ways because I didn't, it was not what I initially wanted to do, but it was something that I learned very early on after having bits of the novel critique in um, in workshops that I needed to have another perspective in, in order to tell the full story. Well, you recently bought the co-working space, DC Writer's Room. I'm curious, are writers able to use the writer's room given the current pandemic? We recently reopened and um, one of the things, of course, you know, changing the way in which we normally operate, um, you know, under normal circumstances, writers can come in at any time at all they want and, you know, the room can be as full as possible. And so now given, you know, social distancing, um, you know, we have set up a slightly different system where we are, you know, limiting the number of people who are there at any one time. And so far, it seems to be working, and hopefully we'll be able to continue working like that. Because I know for sure that being in my house for like three months, four months is a bit much. And I need to, I, I need to work somewhere else. I, I need to move out of here. Sure. Well, as a writer, what appealed to you about working at the DC Writers Room? Um, 
being able to write without distractions is something that um, I think there, there are some writers who can work in a coffee shop. I am not one of those. I need to eliminate as many distractions as possible. Um, one of the things that I know when I'm, I'm here at home trying to write, there's so many other things that I can find to do, so many other things that I actually do. And usually once I get to the writer's room, it's, it's dedicated time. So I know I have taken my, my computer and I'm sitting there and I know I'm going to get something done, whether it's two hours or three hours or four that is the time. That is what I'm there to do. And, and I, I usually end up getting something done. Well, what writing advice would you offer for listeners who are writing their own stories and novels? Well, first is to read. Read as much as you can. Read widely. Read the books you like. Read books you don't like. Um, because I, I think that there's so much that you learn from, from reading. You pick up, you see a writer's style. You see how a writer tells a certain part of a story. You see how a writer falls into dialogue and moves back out to dialogue. How that writer gives you some backstory, it goes into it and then steps back out of it into the present moment. So there's just simply so much that we can learn from reading other writers. And it's, it's not so much about reading. Um, for me, it's not so much about reading books about writing, but reading in the genre itself that you want to write. If you're, if you're writing, you know, whether it's romance or literary fiction, whatever it is, read as much as you can within that genre. And also read outside of it because there are things that you can pick up that other writers do that you might be able to borrow from and that might help your work. And read also read things you don't like. Because when you see something that isn't working, it can also help you to know either what not to do, or you might be able to figure out how to do it better. What what novels or nonfiction books have you read recently that you enjoyed? Um, recently, uh, you know, the entire coronavirus has um, upended my reading, and I have, <laughs> I it, it's just been so difficult to finish anything, so. The last book I read in its entirety, I think, was in February. And it's a book by a Nigerian, a British Nigerian writer, um, The Girl with the Loudin Voice. And it's a, it's a beautifully written book about a, a child, um, basically, who is, um, who is married off early after her mother dies, but who just by sheer will and effort and her fight figures out how to get the education that she wants to get. It's um it's beautiful, it's well told, and I highly recommend it to everybody. Great. Well, where can people find you online if they'd like to learn more about you and your writing and your new novel, Tea by the Sea? Well, my website is um DonnaHemans.com and I'm also on Twitter at, at Donna underscore Hemans and on um, Instagram at the same handle at Donna underscore Hemans. I'm also on Facebook, but Primarily, most of what I do is on Instagram and Twitter and my website. Great. Well, again, we've been speaking with Donna Hemans, author of the new novel, Tea by the Sea. The novel is available available now, so go buy a copy. And Donna, thanks for doing this interview. Well, certainly. Thanks for having me, Jeff. It was my pleasure. Great. 